Hey, welcome to Further in Christendom. I'm your host, Tyler McNabb, and today I'm with a special guest, Dr. Rob Coons. How are you doing today? Great. Fine. Thanks, Tyler. How are you? Doing all right. Doing all right. How how yeah. how hot is it right now in Texas? Not too bad, actually. Okay. 70s. Yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're in the high 60s here, so yeah. not too mu- too big of a difference. So I imagine... It's a little muggy here, but yeah. Okay, okay. I imagine the difference, though, will happen soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're around <laughs> July for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, great. Well, I wanted to have you on to talk about um, one of your one of your latest volume <laughs> uh, on classical theism. Yeah. Right. And it's a, yeah. a publication with Rutledge along with your co-editor, Jonathan Fuquay. And so I thought it'd be good to have you on, kind of talk a little bit about the book, especially for those who maybe are thinking about uh, getting the book, Um, which, by the way, I think, is it still a free on Kindle, Kindle version? No, I think they've, I think they've bumped that up again. Okay. Okay. (laughs) It was free on Kindle. It was free for for a few weeks. Yeah. (laughs) It's it's around 40 on Kindle. 40. Okay. Okay. That's, it's, uh, that's that's still for an academic book. That's a good price. That's not too bad. Yeah. Right. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the book? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this has been a, a big issue, especially in recent years, different conceptions of God uh, within the um, contemporary philosophical scene. And so classical theism represents a, a set of ideas that go back to uh, certainly to the scholastic period, to Thomas Aquinas especially. He's the sort of paradigm of classical theism but also Plotinus, Augustine, and others. Um, so the, the, basic, the basic themes, I guess, are divine simplicity, uh, divine uh, sort of impassibility, um, immutability, and, uh, and the most extreme version, I think, in Thomas's view is, is that uh, God is identical to his own active existence. So that's the sort of the, the Mount Everest of classical theism, basically. <laughs> And and so yeah. the volume kind of is in some sense is a, a response to kind of recent objections or I know like yeah. especially in more broadly evangelical or Protestant circles if you're a philosopher of religion um, classical theism is not so much the rage <laughs> it's it's yeah days so to speak that's right yeah and there's some big names um, Alvin Plantinga and Richard Swinburne and others who uh, William Lane Craig who who clearly reject the, some of the core commitments of classical theism so um, but it's got its defenders too uh, increasingly I think <laughs> so we want to bring that together and so the, the volume is, is is trying to represent you know a variety of, of views both within classical theism and, and some of the critics of it as well well um, and um, one of the things that one, sort of interesting things about the volume, I think, was that we were able to find so many different um, religious perspectives that shared some commitment to uh, to classical theism. So uh, we've got a chapter by Sam Levins on the on Jewish views of classical theism. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm making edit that out. No, no, no worries. Uh, and um, a chapter on uh, Islamic theology, and then you've you've contributed a chapter on Eastern religions. So I think it's pretty interesting, really, as as a basis for a kind of interreligious dialogue, yeah. uh, to see that these different traditions are all, in a way, converging on some some similar ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about some of the other chapters? I know Alexander Proust is in here, Ed Fazer's yeah. in here. Uh, can you can you talk to me a little bit about some of the other chapters? Yeah, yeah. So um, so again, in the, in the first part, we talk about. Um, both these interreligious issues, but also how to define classical theism and and, and roughly, you know, what what's the what's the motivation for it? Uh, so Alex provides a chapter that I think appeals to phenomenology and the practice of religion, especially Christianity, but also other theistic religions, and how that sort of pushes you towards some of these ideas in classical theism. Um, and then we've got uh, again a number of variety of positions represented, uh, a more Anselmian approach to classical theism. Uh, Tim O'Connor's got a, a kind of Scotistic approach based on Scotus, uh, and then there's several of us who represent a more Thomistic picture there, um, and uh, so that's that's sort of the part one. Um, and then in part two, we deal with with some of the objections and the problems that that arise in, in in relationship to this. So, how is God able to have met multiple divine ideas? Hmm. Um, the old the, the modal collapse problem. Uh, Christopher right. Tomaszewski deals with that. Uh, doesn't don't we end up with uh, with everything being necessary if God knows things and causes things to happen 
and he's exactly the same in every possible world, according to classical right. theism. So it looks right. like everything's got to be exactly the same in every in every possible world. So Christopher has done a really good job on that particular objection, and this is an uh, even better version of, of something he's already published along those lines that I think uh, pinpoints exactly what goes wrong in that in that very, very common objection to classical theism. Uh, and then we've got stuff on divine action, on um, the incarnation and the Trinity, which again are often raised as, as problems for divine simplicity. Uh, I think they're not really. I think that you can't have an orthodox view of Trinity or incarnation without something like classical theism. If you don't have classical theism on, on the board on, at, at the beginning, you're going to go badly wrong in trying to think about the Trinity or, or the incarnation. You're going to and, end up and, and if if I if I may just kind of ask for the audience, what why would why would you make such a claim, Doctor Coons? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, if if um, if God isn't absolutely simple, right? And so there's a for instance, there's a distinction between the divine nature and the individual that has the divine nature. Then when you start thinking about the Trinity, you're going to start thinking, well, I guess there's three persons each of whom share the divine nature. Great. Now you're a tri-theist. <laughs> you've got three gods. And, you know, something like Swinburne actually comes pretty darn close to that, I think, actually. Um, so so the classical theism prevents you from going that way, right? Uh, classical theism has to, uh, you have to think about the, the three persons in some different sort of way, as though it, I think it's something like three ways in which the, this one simple divine essence relates to itself, mm. something along those lines. And then that's Relational. much closer to the orthodox view. Right. Right. And and similarly with the incarnation, um, I mean, if if you think that the divine nature is mutable, then the danger will be that you'll think that God, Christ is some kind of a synthesis of the divine and the human kind of mel melded together mm -hmm. somehow. And now you've got uh, modified physitism or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Whereas the orthodox position is that the human nature was assumed by the human nature. Right? So by the divine nature. So the divine nature is not changed at all. What's changed is this particular human nature that's elevated to union with God. And that again gets you gets you, I think, the classical picture of incarnation rather than some weird variation. Yeah. And so when we're talking about classical theism, you mentioned um that God is is immutable and not just kind of like that the, the the weak sauce immutability <laughs> from uh right. certain right, because I Craig uh for example would affirm immutability or Swinburne and some sort of like really of weak a kind. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like wholly immutable, not just like I'm going to remain faithful to my covenant, or you know I'm not going to be right. bad one day. Uh, right. But right. but rather you know I'm I'm I uh, immutable beyond with, time. So wholly together. Self. Right. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. um, that would what that would entail um, uh, impassibility, right? At least certain right. definitions I of think impassibility. So. That's right. And uh, so we can't cause any changes within God. Can't cause God. To, to suffer, kind of weaker definitions of um, impassibility, and that God is simple. He's not, at least in the Thomistic yeah. way, not made up of parts, and in fact is identical to existence itself. Right. Okay. So that's yeah, I mean, what we're talking about. And, and, and one key idea here is that is that God is identical to each of His attributes. So right. God's wisdom is God. God's strength is is God, and so on. Um, Which are all just shorthand descriptions of expressing the same reality. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they're conceptually different, but but in reality, there's just the one thing. That's right. Yeah. All right. Very good. I just wanted to make sure everyone watching is on the same page. What we mean by classical theism, um, not all theists doing philosophy of religion are classical theists. This is, this is a very yeah. traditional uh, kind of broadly theistic approach that uh, you especially see I think you see very early on, but then you you see it kind of yeah. really articulate it well in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, so you have a chapter in it as well. Uh, yeah. Can you yeah. can you tell me a little bit about your chapter? Yeah. So my chapter is titled something like uh, is titled "Does the God of Classical Theism Exist?" So, mm -hmm. so my chapter is really about how natural theology fit, figures into all of this. Um, that for me is the main motivation for being a classical theist. I mean, there are other motivations too, but I think that if you take broadly, you know, Thomistic in arguments for God's existence or Aristotelian arguments for God's existence, uh, it's going to lead naturally to thinking about God in the in this in this classical way. So I run through three or four arguments, like real quickly, <laughs> um, an an argument from motion based on Aristotle in the first way which I think helps to show that God has to be really outside of time. He's got to be atemporal in order to be the cause of the explanation for the forward motion of time itself on an Aristotelian kind of picture. Uh, then secondly, uh, an argument that 
uh, that God is the first cause of everything else. And uh, my favorite way of thinking about that is that the principle of causation we need here is that everything that's causable is caused. Hmm. So, so therefore, the first cause must be an uncausable thing, absolutely uncausable thing. And that also leads, I think, to God's being uh, in, simple and impassive and, and, and immutable and so on, because if he could change in his internal characteristics, uh, then, uh, then, he wouldn't be, then he would be causable, at least to some extent. Uh, and I think, you know, again, if, if you think about God as the first cause of everything else, right, then you have to think about that, you might call it the logical moment in which God exists, right, before, before <laughs> creating anything else or before determining what, whether there should be anything else, right? Well, God in that first logical moment must be complete, right? He's not sort of gappy, lacking essential right. features of himself. He's going he's to have a full complement of, of whatever properties God needs to be to, to be God, right? Could any of those properties be contingent or mutable in any respect? If they were, they'd be causable. If they'd be causable, they'd have to have a cause. But I'm, this is supposed to be the first logical moment, right, in which God is the first cause of everything else. And so you get a contradiction, right? So therefore, whatever characteristics God has in that first logical moment, they must be necessary for him to have those properties, right? And I think I, think, I didn't really make the case in this chapter. But I think you can go further and say, they have to be necessary in themselves, right? They can't even have a derived sort of necessity right. because if they did, again, you'd have to have an earlier moment to explain right. how they got their derived necessity. And uh, and then that that all, again, pushes you towards a kind of divine simplicity picture. So God doesn't have any accidents, to use the scholastic term, right? He just is whatever he could be <laughs> uh, fully right. uh, at all times, right? And, and then the third uh, argument, uh, main argument I consider is... Uh, is something along Thomas's argument in in De Ante et Essentia, where the, or, or, and also later in the Summa, that God is identical to His own active existence. Um, so I try to explain what that means. And can, uh, can we go ahead uh, and talk about that one right now? Is sure, okay? sure, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's a lot to be said here, right? <laughs> now there are different conceptions of existence at, at work here. Um, the modern analytic philosophers tend to follow Frege, Russell, Quine, and this other kind of mainstream tradition and saying that to exist is no big deal. <laughs> it's just whatever is whatever we can think about or talk about exists kind of trivially, right? Everything exists as, as Quine puts it. Um, but, but, but in this context, we're talking about a much more robust kind of existence. We're talking about actually existing as, as, a, as a concrete and, and sort of powerful entity, right? Uh, and, and so we're asking, you know, what, 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 what account can we give of actual existence? What, is that, what does that amount to, basically? Um, and so I consider a number of different proposals that have been made as to how to understand actuality. Uh, and I sort of dismiss some of them as, as being kind of non-starters, right? Um, so you could, um, you could say that, uh, I think as Kant does, that uh, actual has some kind of connection with actually being sensed, right? But th th I think that ends up being circular because there are lots of things that I could have sensed that I didn't sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so um, what, what makes, I still have to explain the difference between actual sensations and merely possible potential sensations. And yeah. so that, that, that particular definition doesn't, doesn't, actually, doesn't actually help. Mm. Um, so there's really two big proposals, I think. Again, uh, one proposal, which is the most popular one in analytic philosophy, which is to say only, there only are actual things, full stop. Uh, all potential things are mere fictions. Uh, they're mere figments of our imagination and so on. That's that's called actualism. And the other alternative, I think, is something like Thomism, where, uh, no, um, potentially real things are also real. <laughs> they're part of a reality. They just lack existence, actual existence. And so then you need to explain what makes the difference between, let's say, the potential third daughter that I could have had but won't have now, right, and my actual two daughters, right? Uh, I mean, both of them, both the potential daughter and my actual daughters are human beings, right? They both would have certain characteristics that, that are fit in with human beings, but there's got to be something that makes my actual daughters actual, right? Mm -hmm. And the other is merely potential. And Thomas's answer is, it's something he calls an act of existence, an act of essay that my daughters possess and that these other merely potential things don't possess, Um so I think that's a plausible way to think about it. And, and then you could think of the actual existence of a creature as involving some nature or essence that represents a potentiality for existence, which is then combined with an act of existence from God, ultimately, 
in order to actualize that nature so that you have a particular actual thing as a result, right? Um, but then if God were like that, then he couldn't be the first cause again, right? Because if he had an essence which had to receive an act of existence from somewhere else, then whatever gave him that act of existence would be his cause, right? So the only way to stop an infinite regress here of causation or an explanation and so on would be to suppose there's an entity whose essence and existence and whose being are, are one and the same thing. So it's not that God has, has a nature which is somehow a bit actualized. It's rather his nature just is actual existence per se, full stop. Right. Uh, and so there's no, there's no question that you could ask. Given there is a God, there's no question you could ask as to why he exists. Mm -hmm. um, he, just, he just is. Um, now, it's important here to distinguish this from Anselm's argument, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you might think, well, haven't you just sort of defined God in, into existence as the thing that necessarily exists and so on? And I think not for, for several reasons. Um, one is, this is actually a stronger claim than what Anselm makes. Anselm claims that God's nature involves existence somehow, necessarily. Mm -hmm. And this, this is a claim that God's nature is existence, that he himself is existence. And that's a, a stronger claim, actually, than Anselm makes. And secondly, you know, the, the, the argumentative strategy here is not to define God into existence. I'm not, we're not claiming that you can just think about existence and say, oh, there must be a being whose who's, who's, who's very being is whose very nature is existence. Um, we can't even suppose that, we can't even show that to be possible just from the armchair, so to speak. We have to instead look at something like a first cause argument, right? You have to say, well, here are all these things that exist. What's the explanation for them? There has to be an ultimate explanation. That's going to have to be the thing that uh, whose, whose essence is existence. So you have to go through that kind of first cause cosmological argument to get to the, even the conclusion that it even were possible for such a being to exist, much less mm -hmm. actual. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really good. Um, whenever I teach this in class um, and try to argue that there's distinction between essence and existence, instead of using uh, St. Thomas's Phoenix, uh, I, I go with the Pikachu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the Pikachu, yeah. the Pokemon has an essence, but unfortunately, sadly, does not exist. Um, yeah. Can you think of another um, kind of reason to reject actualism? Well, um a reason to reject actualism. Yeah, so uh, so a number of problems here, right? One one is that the, the very idea of potentiality that Aristotle introduces was developed by him, I think, in response to arguments by um, Parmenides and Zeno and others that there could be no change, right? So how is change possible, right? How does somebody go from being not French speaking to French speaking, right? Um, if if there's no pre-existing potentiality there in the person uh -huh. that's being actualized, it looks like you've just replaced one thing with another. Right? <laughs> there's no real change that's going I on. Yeah, sure. uh, so, so there has to be, you have to take potentiality seriously. Uh -huh. make, make change possible, make sense of change. Um, this raises another issue that I've been talking about recently. Um, you know, modern quantum mechanics actually supports this as well, because before the quantum revolution, you might well think that there's only the actual world. And it's uh -huh. evolving according to Newtonian laws and so on. Right. Any mere possibility is just a figment of our imagination. Right. But quantum mechanics says, no, you have to take into account the potentialities of things. That that's actually part of the theory. Uh -huh. Part of the dynamics of the theory is how these potentialities evolve. So that's a huge vindication for Aristotle, I think, actually. Yeah. Uh, for this notion that's of the, the reality of the potential, so to speak. That's good. That's good. Um, what about in your defense of the first way? Um, you mentioned that first. No pun intended. Um, yeah, yeah. What, uh, um, how's your sort of glossing differ maybe than some other more traditional glossings? Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, it's pretty radically different, <laughs> I think. Um, but I think it actually fits very closely to the text of the first way. Okay. So what, what other people do when they look at the first way is they say, well, this must just be some short version of what's in the Summa Concantiles or Aristotle's Physics, book seven and eight. And right. so they go, they go there, right? And I think... That by the time Aquinas is writing the Summa, he's realizing all that stuff in the Summa Contrigantiles was way too complicated. I was following all kinds of uh, dead ends. It didn't really work out. Let's just give the simple, clear argument. And so I think it's a huge improvement. It's a simpl simpler, cleaner, leaner version of those other arguments. And so all the stuff about... Um, you know, uh, univocal versus equivocal causation, right? I mean, does uh, does something have to be fiery in order to make really hot to make something else hot, and, and all that that just disappears on my picture. The only the only thing that remains is the idea 
that that for something to become actual, or something else has to already be actual to make it actual, right? That actuality doesn't pull itself up by its bootstraps, and that he, that he explicitly says in the first way, right? That that's that's a key part of part of the argument, and so um, so I think if you just think about Aristotle's view of time, I think this is what Ar what Aquinas realizes. If you think about Aristotle's view of time, time is not a fourth dimension, right? We don't have a kind of block universe in which the past, present, and future just are out there somewhere as if they were some spatial location that separate from us. Uh, time is just the measure of change. Um, so no change, no time, right? right? And you can't define change in terms of time now without unless you're going in a circle. And again, this is a very, most people would define change in terms of time, right? Change just means being some way at one time and a different way at a different time. You can't do that anymore if, if Aristotle is right. There's lots of good reasons to think he is right. So therefore, there's now a problem as to how exactly to explain the fact that time moves forward as it does. Why do we get new moments of time continuously, right? Well, I, you could, one way to think about this is that each moment of time represents its own kind of actuality. And so when a new moment arrives, it's like a new kind of actuality that's never been on the scene before, right, appears, right? Um, because if, if it were already there, so to speak, then it wouldn't be a new moment of time, right? It would already have, have been there. Um, but now what explains the arrival of this new moment of, of uh, this new kind of actuality? It can't be anything in the past because um, they're no longer around, right, uh, by definition at this new moment of time. Uh, it can't be something at that moment of time because you'd end up with an infinite regress, which, which you would need for even if there were a regress, you'd need some kind of ultimate explanation for how all this stuff you know, got actualized. So ultimately, it has to be a timeless being, a timeless being that has a kind of super actuality, right? That can then give actuality to each of these moments of time as they as they arrive. And I think that's that's really the essence of the argument, right? So it's it's not it's not that he's arguing from physics or something. Uh -huh. from, from outdated Aristotelian physics that things need to be pushed along continuously, right? People say, oh, it's just inertia that he's missing, right? If he understood inertia, there'd be no argument anymore, right? I think that's wrong. I think I think for, for a number of reasons, I, there's something like inertia already in Aristotle's system, actually. Um, the, the way the natural bodies move, the way the spheres rotate are all sort of inertial in a sense. Their nature determines that they're going to move in this way. So there's got to be some reason why that's not enough, right? Why that doesn't explain why we need a, a prime mover, right? And I think the reason for that is that these natures that either the spheres or the natural bodies have only define a certain potentiality, a certain way they could be at the new moment of time. They don't actually, they don't actualize that new way of being, right? And for that, you need something outside of time. Um, and then there's, I do, I do sort of fairly traditional thing here, which is to respond to Al-Ghazali, uh, the Islamic thinker who says, well, if God were eternal, then his effects would have to be eternal too. Right. Therefore, right. you can't you can't explain the motion of time by an internal being, and I think that that's wrong, right? Because precisely because um, intentional entities, entities with a mind, can actually produce temporal orders, right? That they themselves don't enter into. So when Tolkien writes the Lord of the Rings and he introduces these four ages, right? He doesn't have to live in any of those four ages in order to create them, right? Uh, he he creates them intentionally, right? On his blackboard or something, right? right? Uh, when 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 Beethoven composes the Ninth Symphony, he doesn't have to become part of the first movement or something in order to do that, <laughs> right? Uh, so in a similar way, God is able intentionally to create this temporal order and to actualize all the moments that are required without Himself entering into time. Oh, that's that's that's, that's an interesting approach. I, I'm going to I'm going to think more about that. Uh, I've I've um, been uh, of the more traditional camp where. Um, God is required uh, uh, for a uh, sustaining cause uh, in order to, uh, uh, in order to be. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. give that some more thought. I mean, some people I think end up pushing the first way towards a kind of conservation picture, right? As though right. God has to act at each instant in order to give existence to things at that right. at that moment. Right. Now, I think Thomas does believe in such a conservation model, yeah. but that comes much much later in the Summa. Gotcha. And it would be really weird if he's presupposing it here in the very first way. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So what What about, what are you working on now? Well, not coincidentally, I guess. Um, my colleague Dan Bonovac and I are actually working on a, a new book on the five ways. Nice. 
And so we've got really new interpretations of all five ways, as it turns okay. out. <laughs> so uh, either we're completely confused <laughs> and wrong about everything, or everybody else has been sort of confused <laughs> about everything. Uh, but I think the upshot of it is that we're going to come up with five arguments that are much better than the traditional interpretation. Right? Okay. And you know, so the principle of charity is going to say, you know, if these are close to the text and these are really good arguments compared to the traditional gotcha. arguments, then we should go with gotcha. them. Okay. Um, I mean, like the third, the third way, for instance, I mean, the traditional interpretation of the third way is a complete mess, right? It is, uh, it is. And, and the fourth way, too, for that matter. Uh, so we've got, we've got radically new interpretations of those okay. that make, make a lot more sense of them. When, when do you expect uh, to be done writing that? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, sort of, it sort of depends on how much you know we end up throwing into it. Okay. Um, we're, okay. We're, so we're so, start so maybe a few more years out? Is that, is a couple of years, I think, probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rob, for coming in and uh, talking with me about your work. Uh, fascinating stuff. I really appreciate Great. it. My pleasure. Great. Nice to talk to you, Tyler. All right. Great talking with you. Yeah, yeah. Take care.